Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> um, have you guys ever met someone that you kind of talk to or you want to share the gospel with, and that person kind of had this view of God where, you know, God, he was a creator. He created all things. But then he kind of stepped back, and he's kind of just watching what happens. Or maybe he's not just watching what happens, but at times he'll kind of kill someone or send a storm or cause some tragedy to happen. You know, some people have this view of God where he's like, he's like a child with an anthill. And he kind of just does things to his pleasure. And he likes to see people suffer. And that's kind of why he does these things. You know, if, if you just look at the Old Testament and you kind of pick it apart, that's kind of a view of God that can come about. You know, you see God and you see how, you know, at times he has this wrath against the people. You know, he's killing people all the time. Um, you know, there's stories where, you know, he's inflicting plagues on people, killing them off, spreading diseases. You know, at times he kills people over what seems to be petty things. You know, a person touches the ark and they die. Just because they touched it, they die. You know, he kills not only the enemies of the Israelites, but he even kills the Israelites themselves. You know, if you kind of just look at that just at face value, it kind of looks like, you know, what kind of God is this you know, that we worship? You know, a God that takes pleasure in killing people, especially for little things? You know, and it causes a lot of people to, to kind of follow into this course where they have disbelief about God. At times even anger against him because he allows these things to happen. But then that's kind of like the Old Testament view of God a lot of times. But then you come to the New Testament and you see this God in the flesh, which is Jesus. And you see a person who's loving, he's compassionate, and he's very accepting of people. You know, he, accept the, he accepts the widows, the orphans, you know, the children, pretty much everyone that no one else will accept, he accepts. And this Jesus, you know, he's humble, he's, he's caring, he's gentle, he's kind, he's welcoming. And so if you have these, these views, you say, okay, there's a God in the Old Testament, and uh, there's a God in the New Testament. And it seems like there's this huge divide between them. You know, one is a God where you always see his wrath and justice, and the other God, you always see his compassion and his love for people. And so people tend to say, it looks kind of like there's two different gods. There are two different books, two different gods here. And it causes a lot of people to have a lot of conflicts and disbelief. Now I bring this up because this was kind of the case of one of my friends this week. You know, they were trying to evangelize, you know, someone that they know, a very smart individual. And this person had grown up Christian all their life. But it was this conflict that they weren't able to resolve. The God of the Old Testament, he's so angry. You know, he's always just killing people, allowing people to suffer. And the New Testament, it's like a different person. You know, we need to resolve these kind of issues. You know, and what helps us is an accurate understanding of who God is as revealed to us through the Bible. So knowing the scriptures well is important. And I think it's a bit easier to understand than we think. You know, if you think about a good father, you know, a father can be loving and strict at the same time. There's not a conflict at all there. You know, even though that God disciplines his people, allowing them at times to fall into destruction and slavery, it says this about God. In Isaiah 22, it says that God, he weeps over the destruction of his people. And who allows destruction to come to his people? It's God. He allows it to happen. He orchestrates it at times. But it says at the same time, he weeps over the destruction of his people. And I think if you're a parent, or if you're a teacher even, you could easily understand this. There's times when you really do desire what's best for a child, what's best for your student. But if you look at that child and their nature, what's rooted in them, what's imprinted upon them, you know, they have this nature that is, is not good. And so at times, you have to discipline them. But that's a part of the love that you have at the same time. You know, you see them and you love them, you care for them, but you see them going down the wrong path. What do you do? 
at times these things are necessary. And I think the problem is that people, they like to pick apart the Bible. And that's how they come to these kind of conclusions. Where God is evil. Where he's demanding. Where he causes people to suffer. But at times like that, you know, we, we need to realize, you know, how was it when we were children? You know, when you were young, when you were kind of in like a rebellious stage against your parents, how did you view them? When you wanted to do what you wanted to do, they wouldn't let you do it. And they'd stop you from going out at night. You know, they'd limit you in different ways, hold you back. You know, a lot of times you think that your parents are the selfish ones for not letting you do what you want to do. But then as you grow up and you get older, what do you realize? That was for your good that they were doing those things. It wasn't to limit you. It wasn't to cause you to suffer. It wasn't because they were selfish. It's because they truly desired what was best for you. They truly loved you with all their hearts. And they wanted to help you and guide you and protect you. So once again, we see the problem is this. As we went through last week from Hosea, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. It's because people don't really understand God. They don't understand God's word. And they come to these conclusions. So there's three things that I want to get across to you today as we look at this book of Jonah. The first thing is that God has a plan. God has a plan, but when you try to run from that plan, things aren't going to go well. Secondly, you can't force your plan to become God's plan. You know, this is Jonah's mistake. You know, you cannot force the hand of God or force God to do something that you want him to do just to fit your desire. And then finally, and third, and this is what I've been talking about, you know, this realization that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, they're one. Our God is one. He is a God of wrath, a God of justice, but also a God of the greatest love and the greatest compassion. And most importantly related to this is, it's basically the theme of Jonah, salvation comes from the Lord. And what that means is, if you look at God's justice and his love, it comes about through his salvation to us. Now, previously, in the last few messages, we've been going through all these books, especially of the Old Testament, and we went through kind of Amos, and it was kind of a time where Jeroboam II was reigning. It was a time of, of privilege. You know, every, everything was going well, and they were rich, you know, trade was going well, and there was a lot of problems at the same time, because the poor people were neglected, and people started turning more to idols again. And then we came to Hosea, and we saw that there's this marriage between God and the Israelites. And God, during this time, he is he's showing them that basically they are committing adultery. And this takes the form of idolatry against him. And so God, he's about to bring judgment upon his people. We're kind of continuously building up to that point where God is going to basically bring this judgment upon his people. He's going to send them into exile and to Assyria. So here is where we find the book of Jonah. Today's message. Jonah, his name, he's a prophet. His name means dove. And he prophesied at the same time as these other people. So at the same time as Amos, at the same time as Hosea, Jonah is living during that same time. But there's something unique about this book. Jonah, he's going to be preaching in basically what is the capital of the entire world. One of the greatest empires of that time. And that city is Nineveh. So during the time God, he's going to send Jonah over 500 miles away from his home to this place, to the Ninevites. This is the capital of Assyria. And, you know, this, this city, Nineveh, it has a very humanistic background. You know, it's a city that's basically set up against God. It was first built by Nimrod, you know, and it's known as the Great City. And this is the center of the empire. So Jonah, he's going to go there, he's going to pronounce judgment upon these people. And the special thing about this book also is that this book, the prophet is preaching 100% to Gentiles. So these are not Israelites, these are not Jews. They're 100% Gentiles. This is an entirely different nation. 
You know, this book is very unique. This never happens. You know, if you read the other books of the Bible, it's always about God and the Israelites. This is a book that's about God and this other group of people. It's very uncommon. And so let's look at this book together. Um, Jonah, if you have your Bibles, you can kind of follow along. We're just going through the chapters, basically. And it's very short. You know, you could read this, the whole book, in probably like 10, 15 minutes if you wanted to. Um, four chapters. So the first point today is that there are problems that arise when you try to run from the plan of God. And this is how the book of Jonah starts. The word came, and it says, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Because its wickedness has come up before me. Immediately, what does Jonah do? He runs away. Now, I love this. It's so honest. Because I think this is what's really in our hearts. You know, when God presses something upon you, are you like, oh yeah, God, I'm going to do that. Absolutely. If God, if you feel that this, this thing upon your heart to go evangelize or share the gospel with someone, are you like, okay, I'm going to do it right away. You know, if God feels or is directing you towards this plan or this direction, do you immediately follow? I don't think so. I think if you're really honest with yourself, in the same way that Jonah is kind of honest here, the first thing our heart wants to do is run away. Run away from God. You know, a lot of people, they relate to this really well. You know, fighting against the plan of God. It's kind of in our nature. You know, we have our own desires. We have our own our wants, our own plan that we want to see carried out. You know, even for me, you know, I had a plan for my life. You know, when I was in high school, my plan was I'm going to go to college, study engineering, get a degree, find a girl, get married, work as an engineer, and for some you know nice company, do engineering, and then I'll attend church. You know, and I'll attend church. I'll give my tithe. And if I'm really feeling holy or godly, you know, maybe I'll attend a Bible study. <laughs> that was kind of the extent of my direction. Is that what happened? <laughs> Obviously not, because I wouldn't be standing here if I, filled out, if I was able to fulfill my own plan. You know, God has a plan for our lives, and it's about finding that plan and matching with it. You know, Jonah, what he does is, you know, he hears the plan of God, he runs away. He, gets, he tries to get as far away as possible. He goes and he boards a ship to sail away the opposite direction of where he's supposed to go. And it says, at that point, the Lord sends a storm. It's a terrible storm. They think they're all going to die. Everyone on board thinks they're going to die. They're asking, what should we do? You know, what should we do to stop this storm from happening? So they ask, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? And in verse 12, he says, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. This is what Jonah says. If you want to appease God and you want the storm to calm down, pick me up, throw me in. And I think, wow, you know, this is so valiant. He's going to sacrifice himself for these people. I think that's so amazing. But then if you look deeper, Basically, you know, we'll find out later, he's basically choosing death rather than going to preach to the people of Nineveh. That's how badly he doesn't want to do this. He would rather die than follow God's plan. That's how determined he is. And so, reluctantly, the sailors, they throw him overboard. They throw him overboard, but does he get his wish? Does God let him die? No. Absolutely not. Even, even death. You know, this for him is kind of a selfish escape he's trying to do. But God doesn't allow it. It says in verse 17, But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. And this is pretty much what most people know about Jonah. You know, he was in this fish three days and three nights. Some people think it's a whale, but it actually never says that. It's just a big fish. But he's in there three days and three nights. I can't explain the science behind it, how, but this is what it says. And so in the fish, you know, God is not going to let him die. In the fish is the time where he's persuaded ultimately to follow God's plan. Even though Jonah thought that he would rather die than follow God's plan, he soon found that some things might be a little worse than death. 
And inside the fish, it was a great time of distress for Jonah. And I think that when you fight against the plan of God, trying to get your plan to win out over his, after that point, sometimes you might wonder why things don't work out the way you want. And no matter how much you try, they just don't work out. Or you might be able to get them to work out to a point, but in the end, you're not happy. And I think there's three types of people here. You know, there's people when, between their plan and God's plan, there are people that, to a point, they succeed. They succeed, they get what they want, they get their own way, but what's the end result? They're not happy. There's something missing, there's something unfulfilled. You know, they might get all the riches, you know, the success, Everything might go their way at a lot of different costs. But in the end, they still feel something's lacking here. Something's not right. And then there's a second group of people who they try to get their plan to be achieved, their goal. You know, they try and they try and try, and it never works out. And so all they do is they just become bitter. They become bitter and angry and resentful. You know, why did I have this life? Why did things work out this way? This way? A lot of times they turn this anger and they, they direct it towards God, blaming God for their state. And they just end up bitter and just settle for whatever life has given them. But then the third type of people, or the third type of person is, I think, where we have to find ourselves. And it's the type of person that really is able to see God's plan and time schedule accurately. So God, of course, has a plan. Being able to see that, but the time schedule as well. Because God might lead you to a certain point just for a period of time. And he might lead you somewhere else later. So some people, they might get stuck at that point and not know God is leading them somewhere else. Or they might wonder, why did this happen? You know, why is your past so full of scars? Why did those things happen? Why did God lead you to meet that person, to have that relationship? You know, why did God lead this when it ended up terrible in the end? The difference is being able to see that God has a reason. He had a plan there and a time schedule. But now he might be leading you somewhere else. So it's having the eyes to see God's plan. It's having the eyes to see God's desire. It's having the eyes to see the path that God is leading you on. And the difference is you either end up with a heart of regret and anger or you have a heart of it is a thanksgiving. If you can see God's direction, no matter what happens, you will have a heart of thanksgiving. You know, for Jonah, he was able to finally realize the plan of God during this time of suffering, this time of distress. Ultimately, he realized that God was with him. He had this prayer while he's inside the belly of the fish. In chapter 2, verse 1, Inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. And his prayer is very beautiful, if you actually read through it. He basically says, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Basically saying, I called, you answered. In verse 5, The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. You know, there's a lot of imagery here. It's basically he's sinking down into darkness, to death. And at this point, the reality of his choice is starting to come to him. He's starting to have regret. But then he ends it with this. He says, But you brought me, but you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. So basically, God is rescuing him. God is the source of his life. And he makes the greatest confession at the end. In verse 9, he says, Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from the Lord. You know, if you forget everything else today about today's message, just remember that. Salvation comes from the Lord. That's the theme of this book. And he realized that this even applies to him. 
Salvation wasn't in his own hands. He didn't even have control over his life. You know, he can't earn his salvation. His life, everything was in God's hands. His life and his death. He realized this. And at that point, the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited him out on dry land. And so finally, and then next we go to, he finally follows the plan of God in chapter 3. He goes to Nineveh. So the word came to him a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim the message I give you. So Jonah obeys, he goes. And you see that Nineveh, it was an important city. And he believed that it would require three days to actually go and preach the gospel here. Or not preach the gospel, but basically he's going to preach condemnation to the people. It's not a friendly message that he's giving them. He's basically going to say destruction is going to come here. So in his mind, he thought, three days. But what happens on the first day? It says on the first day, he started into the city and proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And the result? The Ninevites believed in God. That's all it took. You know, just one word <laughs> or one sentence. You know, and the Ninevites, they believed in God. I, see, I think this is simply amazing. You know, if you look at, you know, how are people saved? Now, are people saved through our persuasion? You know, if we have a time schedule fit for someone, you know, if we follow that perfectly and, and do things according to that plan, is it going to work out where they're going to be saved? And I think here we see the truth that salvation is 100% in the hands of God. There's no doubt about that. And what this practically means is, you know, when we go out to evangelize, it's not about God matching us and our schedule for things. It's about us matching God's time schedule. You know, the point is we have to discover God's time schedule and His plan. You know, we have ours, but God has His. And in His schedule, that's when people are saved because it is 100% the work of God. And continuing on, it says that the people in that city, it says they declared a fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, they put on sackcloth. Basically, the whole city believes in God. You know, it didn't matter if they were politicians, if they were the king, if they were beggars in the street. The whole city believed. And it says that, you know, through this, the city of 120,000 people were saved in a single day. You know, that's pretty amazing to me. You know, it's not three days, you know, it's a single day. He just goes there, he pronounces judgment. It's not secret friendly at all. You know, he pronounces judgment, and through the word of God, 120,000 people are saved. You know, that is no doubt the miracle of God. But how does Jonah feel after this happens? So everyone's being saved. The whole people are saved. You know, everybody should be rejoicing. Jonah should be so happy. But what is Jonah's response to this? It's amazing. His response to the amazing miracle, the work of God, is this. He is angry. Angry. All these people are being saved. It's wonderful. Let's celebrate. No. He is angry. And so finally, in the last chapter of Jonah, we see why he did what he did. Why he had these actions. Why he ran away. Why does Jonah run away? Why is he angry? It says in chapter 4, verse 1, that Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? So what does this mean? Jonah knew what was going to happen. Jonah knew that if he followed God's plan and went to Nineveh, the people would be saved. So what's his motive? Why does he run away? Something I finally realized, you know, after meditating on this and reading it through again, is that the, sto the, the story of Jonah, the story of Jonah, it's about a man trying to force the hand of God. He wanted the Ninevites to be killed. That's why he ran. It wasn't for another reason. He wanted them to all die. 
So the second point today is forcing your plan over God's plan. We're basically forcing the hand of God. In Jonah 4, verse 2, it says, That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So here's the problem. Jonah, he accurately knew God. He knew God, that he was a God of love. But the problem is this. His heart was distant from God's. His heart didn't match God's. And that's why he says after this, Now Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. He is so stubborn. You know, he would rather die himself than watch people be saved. And so the point for us is this. And you can know God. You can know accurately who God is. You can know accurately all about him. But the question is, does your heart connect to God's heart? You know, when God has tears for the field, do you have tears for the field? The Israelites, they knew God, they followed God. But because the Israelites, they didn't know his heart, they continually strayed. They continued to fall into to idolatry. They continued to fall into problems. That is why, you know, the greatest prayer that you can have is really to have the heart of God. You know, this is one of the prayers that I have myself all the time. You know, regarding the people around me, regarding just my life. And I think the greatest prayer that you can have is if you could gain the heart of God. This is one of the reasons that David was so blessed, because he had the heart of God as well. And this is also where the gospel ultimately truly connects with you. you know, the gospel is not just some head knowledge. The gospel really needs to connect here, and that's when it becomes real. You could know it in your head so well, but if it doesn't connect with your heart, you will be like Jonah running away from God's plan to fulfill your own desires, to fulfill your own wants. You know, next, you, you may be like Jonah. You know, a lot of us have different people around us that we don't necessarily like. Um, you might want to have, like, someone around you that you just would rather see disappear. You know, you hate them, you don't like them. In the same way Jonah desires the people of Nineveh to be destroyed, but this is the spiritual battle. You know, it's our, our nature, which is selfish, which is prideful. And it goes against what God desires. Because God is a God of love. He's a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. You know, there's no greater God than He. He showed a mercy. He shows mercy to sinners like you, and like me, though we don't deserve it. You know, can we show this to others? Honestly, no, we can't. But, if we have Christ working in us, if the Holy Spirit is filling us, then we can. So if our natures are reigning in us, we're going to be selfish, we're going to be prideful. But if you let Christ work in you, then that love, that compassion will come out. You know, near the end we see that after this, John is angry, so he goes and he says he sat down east of the city. Then east of the city, he makes himself a shelter. He sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. So you can kind of picture him. Jonah, you know, he goes off and he sits on the outskirts of the town and he's just getting ready. You know, what's going to happen? Basically, you know, he's like, get the popcorn ready. He's ready for the show. He's hoping that there are some people that aren't going to be saved. It's like God will bring destruction upon them. That's his mindset still. He's still angry. He still wants them to die. He wants to see the show of God bring destruction upon them. And we look at Jonah, it kind of ends on a strange note. You know, God, you know, he's trying to help Jonah realize something. But Jonah never does. But us reading it, we can. And so if you look at the last chapter of Jonah, it says in verse 6, it says, you know, Jonah built this shelter. And it says, The God provided a vine 
and made it grow over Jonah to give shade to his head and ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the vine. So if something benefits Jonah, he's happy, he's good, everything's good, even though God is still in control. But in verse 7, But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed away the vine. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on his head, so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said, Do you have any right to be angry about the vine? You know, God, he's comparing these two situations. Because both God is sovereign over. He's in control. He's in control over the lives of the Ninevites. And he's also in control of the life of Jonah. He's sovereign over both. But any time it doesn't go well for Jonah, what is he? He's angry. He's bitter. He just wants to die. You know, this is Jonah's mindset. If it doesn't benefit me, if it's against me, I hate it. And the story of Jonah ends with this. In 4 verse 10, the Lord said, You have been concerned about the vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left hand. And many cattle as well should not be concerned about the great city. And that's how it ends. So the conclusion is this. You know, we saw how Jonah, he tried to run from God. But what was the result? There was a storm and problems. And ultimately he was trapped inside this fish for three days. So running away from God, it just resulted in problems. And then we saw why Jonah ran away. He ran because he wanted his own desire to be fulfilled. He wanted the Ninevites dead. But once again, that, pro that, that plan that he had, it's not fulfilled. Only God's plan is fulfilled in the end. And the reason? Because God is sovereign. And even though we might be hateful, you know, God is compassionate and loving. So the problem of Jonah is this. It's his nature. The nature of man of all of us, it's so rooted and imprinted with sin, with the pride of Genesis 3, being, wanting to be like God, wanting to have success, you know, all these things, all of our desires. The selfishness that only thinks that we are important. You know, Jonah, he, repre he represents someone that is used by God, even though they're still rooted in this selfish sin. But that is why Christ came to die for us, to die for our sin, to uproot us from that Genesis 3 problem and uproot us in the gospel. Then at that point, and only at that point, can we even overcome ourselves. Secondly, now I started with this, but the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, they are the same. You know, a lot of times you never see the compassionate side of God in the Old Testament. This is one of the books where you see this other side of God. And Jonah says of him, I knew that you are a gracious, a compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, and a God who, resents, who relents from sending calamity. You know, part of God's love, his compassion, is displayed for us through Christ. And God ultimately demonstrates all these qualities. They're fulfilled and demonstrated through the work of Christ. You know, as Jonah said, salvation is from the Lord. He came to save us. And if God came to save us, I want you to remember this. If God can save us and forgive us, even though we're sinners, how much more can we save those that are around us? Through working in hand with God. If you remember when Jonah was on the boat, when Jonah was on the boat, if he didn't speak up at all, the people would have all died. If when he went to Nineveh, he didn't speak up, the people, 120,000, would have died. If we don't speak up, 
ultimately the people around us will die. But at times we don't speak up because, for example, like Jonah, we're sleeping securely on the boat. We're so secure. We're comfortable. At times we don't speak up because maybe we're angry or we're selfish. We want people to get what they deserve ultimately in the end. You know, it's just about looking out for number one, which is yourself. You know, God shows us mercy, compassion, forgiveness. He saves us. Yet we struggle to do the same for others. We receive the love, we receive the good, but we don't show that love to others. We receive forgiveness, but many times we don't want to give it because we are stubborn. Just like the people of Israel, just like Jonah. So today, if you're holding on to a grudge against someone, you know, now is the time to realize and really let it go. You know, I don't know why Jonah hated the Ninevites, what reason he had. You know, it could have been something personal they did against him, like an Ninevite attacked him or attacked his family in some way, or against the people in general he could have been angry because of what they did. I don't know why he wanted them all dead, but I do know this. I know that Jonah, he was quick to get angry, and he was not able to forgive. He was always swept away by his emotions. He was angry to the point where he would rather die than forgive them or show them compassion. So finally, one last thing that we need to realize is that, you know, we are not Jews here. You know, we are in the same state as these Ninevites were, honestly. You know, the people of the Nineveh, they were Gentiles. They weren't the chosen people. We're not, we weren't the chosen people originally. You know, it was just for salvation. It was just for the Jews originally. You know, God could have easily destroyed us. Even as sinners, God could have sent us to hell, which is ultimately what we really deserve. But instead, God sent his one and only son, the one whom he loved. He sent him to die for you and I. You know, that son is the Christ, our Savior, our atoning sacrifice. And that's what allows this, this, you know, this just and righteous God to meet with a sinner like me. And that's ultimately called grace. It's the core of who our God is. I just want to end with this. Um, you know, the justice and wrath, the compassion of love, we see it displayed through the cross. Jonah wanted to die so the Ninevites would die. But Christ came to die so that we may live. And that's our God. That's the difference between us and God. We're selfish, but God is loving and caring to the point of dying on the cross for us. Let's pray as we hold on to this message. And dear Father God, we just thank you once again for this day. Father God, we know that you, know, you have a plan for our lives, but we also have a plan for our own lives things that we desire, things that we don't want. So I pray, Father God, more than anything else, that we can truly gain your heart. That when we look out at things and, and what path to follow, that we can truly be guided by the Holy Spirit and know that whatever happens, whether good or bad, that if we are within your plan, that we are on the right path. We pray, Father God, that you allow us to continue to show our love and compassion for others in the same way that we have received it. And we pray that you just guide us and lead us this week. We pray all these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.